أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعد الله المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ومساكن طيبة في جنات عدن ورضوان من الله أكبر ذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم أن الله has promised the believing men and the believing women paradise جنات which means gardens wherein rivers flow beneath them and that they will be in their eternal and beautiful dwellings in this wide paradise however وَرَضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ he says pleasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for Allah to be pleased with you and bless you this is greater ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ verily this is this is the ultimate success the greatest success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the discussions that we've been having, we've been speaking about prayer generally. However, I've changed topic tonight. And the core thing that we need to understand is something that we miss a lot of the time. And that is, what is our goal in life? You know when you ask a young person that's in school and you say to them, what would you like to do when you leave school? What do you want to become? And they're like, I don't know. I have no goal. I'm just studying and we'll see where it takes me. This is terrible. It's absolutely terrible. You need to have a goal. You need to have foresight. Have a look. What is it that you want to do? Have a look where you want to go. For example, people get work experience. What do they do? They just go work with a cousin or an uncle. They don't even have a look about, at, at, at what would I like to do as a vocation in the future. There's so many excellent vocations out there, ones where you can learn things and educate yourself and help yourself, your family and your community. We don't look at that. In fact, I remember as a youth, whenever I used to ask my parents I want to go out somewhere, they would always ask me, where are you going? And if I can't give them a destination, I'm not allowed to go out. Do you know why? Because if I just go out without a destination, I'm going to get up to no good, without a doubt. If I don't know where I'm going, I'm just going to get in the car and drive around and wait and see what, what unfolds. This is the problem. But if you have a destination, there's two purposes. One, there was no mobile phones, so at least they know where you are if something goes wrong. Two, at least you know where you're going. With all of these things, you need to have some sort of goal, some sort of vision. That a vision that in five years, this is where I want to be. In ten years, this is what I want to be. Ask somebody who's a little bit older than you, who's five years older than you, what would you have done five years ago that would have had you in a certain position today? Is there anything that you would have done five years ago that would get you in that? But nobody asks that because no one cares. Instead, they just sit there and they just do their thing and just sort of skim by life. Now, when it comes to the hayat al dunya, this is problematic. And it can affect your life, it can destroy your life. It can put you on a path to destruction in this world. But the problem is, in this world, you're going to leave this world anyway. So it's not a huge problem so to speak although it is important for you to ponder and think about this but for the hereafter it is a massive problem and the issue is a lot of us have no foresight towards what are we heading towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us clues and identifiers throughout the year for example on certain nights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to the Anbiya what to ask for Laylat al-Qadr for example he says ask for al-Afiyah Al-Afiyah is well-being. Ask for well-being. Well-being, Al-Afiyah is greater than health. It's a level above health. But you have health, your body is physically health, but you want well-being. You want that health and you want to have the ability to utilize that health. There's no point in being healthy, for example, but stuck in some sort of pri prison. There's no point in it being healthy, but yet having no ability. Why? Because you don't feel good on the inside. So you want well-being, an all-round thing. On the day of Arafah, for example, the day of Arafah, when you go to Hajj, you are encouraged to ask for everything. But the greatest thing, alaykum to ask for is fiqaq wa raqabati min al-nar. 
that, oh Allah, free my neck from the fire of hell. This is the greatest thing that you ask for. So on certain nights, in certain occasions, in certain places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us exactly what to ask for. Now a lot of the time when you talk to people about religion, they think that all they want from their religion is freedom from the fire of hell, inshaAllah, and their entrance to paradise. However, freedom from the fire of hell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us that if you man zuhsiha, even if you, were, you just skip over the line, you free yourself from the fire of hell and you make paradise, this is a success in itself. That you've won, you've done something good. However, your whole life will be based upon just crawling over the line. Whereas if you have a vision and you envision a greater goal, and there's nothing greater than Ridwan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرِضْوَانُ مِنْ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ this is greater. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different rewards. And in fact, I'm speaking about something that's far beyond my knowledge, far beyond my level of faith. This level of Ridwan is of the highest level. It's of the highest level. It's higher than Yaqeen, it's higher than everything. At the top, top, top is that Ridwan Allah. This is it. Now, the thing is, I'm not saying you're going to leave this and, and have or attain this stage, but at least, you know, hold on, this is what I want to head towards. I want to head towards something that's greater than paradise itself. There's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that speaks about, and I've mentioned this before, there's three things that are greater than paradise itself. Because everything that we do in this life is all about, I'm trying to attain whatever pleasures I can attain. I want to get the best possible car I can get. I want to wear the best possible clothes that I can get. I want to get the best possible hairdo I can get. I want to marry the best possible wife that I can get. I want to go on the best possible holiday that I can get. And in paradise, people think this is it. I will have the hur and the qasur and the anhar, that I will have the, 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 the nymphs from heaven and I will have the palaces in heaven and I will have the rivers in heaven. But there's something that's beyond that. In fact, there's three things that are greater than paradise itself. And then above those three things, there's three things that are special for the people who reach that stage of Radwan. But first we'll speak about the three things that are better than paradise itself. And the three things that are better than paradise itself, number one, <coughs> the thing that's better than paradise is once everyone enters paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command a caller to say that this paradise is forever. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أَبَدًا That this paradise is for eternity. That's better than paradise itself. Why? Because we know in this dunya, no matter how good you have it, it's going to end. Whatever it is, it's going to end. Your youth is going to end. The fun time that you're having is going to end. The freedom of living with your parents and not paying any bills is going to end. All of these things are going to end. But in the Jannah, it's eternal. It's never going to end. This is better than paradise itself. Number two is Jiwar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. To be in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be neighboring. Regardless of the vicinity, you're neighboring the Holy Prophet and the progeny of the Holy Prophet, the best of the best. This is better than paradise itself. Better than paradise itself. This is why you, you get a, a small taste of that when you go to the ziyarah. Ziyarat Rasulullah, Ziyarat Abu Abdullah, Ziyarat Amir al-Mu'mineen, the ziyarah of any of the Imams. And you go to these countries, sometimes the parts of Iraq that you go to, for example, Karbala. Karbala is very run down. It's a very poor part of Iraq. In general, you see it, that it's generally a pretty run-down place. However, when you go to that place and you're in the vicinity and proximity of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, paradise. However, you know, outside is something else. And I'm not talking about the architecture or the domes. Or it's that feeling of that proximity. And the third thing is Ridwan Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. That's better than paradise itself. That Allah is pleased with you that you have entered paradise. In fact... It is our aim and our goal in life generally to please those that are superior to us. We look in everything we do in life is to please our parents. You notice a child even at a young age, all they do is they attempt to please you with whatever it is. And this is why sometimes when a child says something funny and it might not be a good thing all the time, you laugh because you think it's cute and so the child will continue to say it. Because he sees he gets your attention and he's getting some sort of validation from whatever it is that you're saying. And so he'll continue to say it. And as he grows older, this is the same thing. 
You want to please your parents, so you're trying all the time, what can I do to please these parents? This is a small taste of what attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Attaining the pleasure of your Creator. This pleasure, or this Ridwan, it stems from love, mahabba. That before you even look at attaining that pleasure, you need to have some love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And people say, you know, you can't obviously be forced to love Allah. When Nabi Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to him and he tells, he tells him, teach my servants my love. And he says, and how shall I do that? He says, remind them of the benefits that you've given them. Remind them of the benefits that I've given them, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. In Dua Abi Hamza, Al-Thamali, this, this Dua that is very mustahab to read in this month, he says, Sayyidi ana saghir alladhi rabbayta. That my master, I am the small one that you raised and you nurtured. He says, he says Wa ana al jahil alladhi alamta. Wa ana al. Wa ana al dhal alladhi hadayta afwa. Wa ana al wadi alladhi rafata. Wa ana al khaif alladhi amanta. Wa al jaa alladhi ashbata. He says, Oh Allah, that I am. This young one that you nurtured and raised. Oh Allah, I am this low one that you elevated. Oh Allah, I am this ignorant, misguided one that you guided. Oh Allah, I am the one that was afraid and you gave me security and safety. I was the one that was hungry and you fed me. From a young age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken care of all of these things. And throughout your life and you see how many paths you could have taken, Allah has brought that back to you. These loving parents that care about you, Allah has given you that. The fact that you wake up in the morning, Allah has given you that. The fact that you have the ability to breathe God's free air and oxygen, Allah has given you that. For every single breath that you take. The fact that you are pain free most of the time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you that. And so more and so many and so more that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continually showers us with these bounties and these benefits. These are the things that begin to bring that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in to our hearts now before we continue into this discussion something that's very important that we need to look at and this important thing is that i need to make this pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my goal and a lot of the time we don't make it our goal at all we don't even look at it as something that's important or something that we need i'll give you an example when we look towards following a marja for example I don't know the Islamic laws, therefore I need to go and follow a marja. So what do I look for in a marja? There's rules towards what you look for in following a certain marja. The majority of people, they look for, what can I get away with? I'm married and I want to do mat'a. Sid Sistani says that I can marry only if I want to do mat'a, she must be of the same creed and faith and she must be of equal or better than your wife in faith or you can't do it. So you know what, I don't like this marja anymore. Let's go find another marja. I want to play arwa'mi. I want to play cards. And so therefore, which marja? And mind you, most of the people that play cards, they didn't care what the marja said anyway. But they just use it as an excuse. Someone comes in, yep, fadlallah. That's the, the taqlid that I do, and this is why I can play cards, for example. So on and so forth. Whatever it is, they feel like they want to justify it in this manner. I'm hungry. I feel like fried chicken. They say, that's the sanad that they use, they say, sounds like the sum of the Qur'an al-Azhar, who say, yaqulun, yaqulun. They say that KFC and punch bowl is halal, let's go and eat. No one checks how halal it is, where it comes from, where they get their certification, anything like that, you just go there and you eat. Why? Because you're thinking about, I'm covered, and they can wear the blame. KFC can wear the blame for whatever it is that I'm eating. McDonald's Lidcom can wear the... The, 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 the blame for it, whatever it is I'm eating. And people take it further, further than this. You see a brother, for example, sitting at a cafe, music's pumping, the waiters are dancing the coffees to the tables, okay? And they're sitting there and they have a scantily clad woman sitting with them. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Alaikum salam. What's going on? Doing mata. All good. Driver. That's it. It's all good. Everything else is justified. The music, the dancing, everything else, it's all justified. Why? Because there's just one 
That's it, and he's put that. He, he, he's let you know, so it's all justified. You know, even though you could have checked before if he's married or temporarily married on Facebook before you even asked him the question. However, what he's done instead is that's it. He's giving you that justification. Where's Where's the Rada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this? Where's the pleasure of Allah? When do I look at, for example, the marja I want to follow and I say to myself, I say to myself that I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not that I'm just skimming over the line of halal or allowable. And this is what people hide behind. It's not haram. I go and get an outrageous hairdo, it's not haram. I want to go get a nose ring, it's not haram. If it's not in your culture, for example, why do you want a nose ring? I want to go and tattoo my face. I'm talking about like tattooed eye eyebrows or tattooed eyelashes or whatever it is so I can have permanent makeup. I swear, I was in Hajj one year and there was a lady who had that much work on her face, she didn't have to put any makeup in the morning. And we're in the haram and her face was glowing like a neon sign in Vegas. That you could see, that's, this is the way her face, but she's in a haram. And everyone else has got no makeup. She's in a haram on her face. Why? Because her lips are uh, uh, blown up and her nose and her eyes and her face is all done up for this and it's like permanent makeup. She doesn't have to do it. So therefore she's not doing anything haram. Because, you know, according to what everyone else will see, it's khalat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you look at this and you think to yourself, this person, don't, don't they think, or us, don't we think that we should Look towards the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where's the other rub in this equation? Don't I look at it and say, hold on. Some marajah say this is haram, some don't. You know what? I want Allah to be pleased with me. I don't want this rubbish. A couple of printed cards, aren't they, they, they're not going to change my life. They're not, gonna, they're not going to make my quality of life less. That I can walk away and I can leave this. I don't really need to build up a list of accolades or a CV of girls that I've dated. Or guys that I've spoken to on Facebook, I don't need these things built up. Because you know what? You talk to a guy and you talk to a girl, same thing. They're all the same. Guy is the same guy with a different face and a girl is the same girl with a different face. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he speaks a little bit about this, specifically when he speaks about intercourse. And with intercourse, he, sp he speaks about it being, that's it, a short time of pleasure. Once that pleasure is achieved, that's it. It's finished. So wouldn't you rather, for example, get married, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't need to have a whole CV of people that you've spoken to before. Through this marriage, you are seeking the pleasure of Allah. You know when you speak to some people, bro, you need to get married. He says, oh, I'm 24 and I'm too young. 23, I'm going to wait a little bit and then I'm going to do it. On what basis or whose basis are you too young? 23 or 24. That you don't even look towards the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're just thinking of yourself. Ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. And he gave you the sexual desire so you can reproduce. Not just for fun. It wasn't there just for fun. He gave it to you so you can reproduce, so you can make a family. So you can make life go on and the world go on in the, on this earth. This is the whole point. And if you're not establishing a family, where are you from the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We go on and we do other things, all of these other things. And the reason I'm tackling these, all of these issues simultaneously because they simultaneously run in negation to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because people don't look at it like this. They say, where can I skim the law? They think they're dealing with the Australian tax office, for example. That how much can I claim and get back? What can I do? All of this is, it lacks volition. The, pe the people that do this, sorry, lack volition. They lack this internal ability to be substantial. And you know what? Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt, they tell us this dunya is low so we don't follow it. But the way that they were in this dunya, was it not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his own hands when he buried uh, his companion as shaheed, uh, Sa'id ibn Ma'ath. When he buried him, he built the grave, he dug the grave himself, and he made sure the grave was perfect and sturdy. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, you spent much time on making this grave look perfect and sturdy. And he says, yes, even though I know it will perish and it will fall. May Allah have mercy. Rahmallah rajulun. Amra'in asna'a fa'atqan. That he makes something and he makes it proper. He does it and he does it proper. 
that he goes through it all the way. You're living your life and you're not doing anything properly. That you live your life and everything is just on the edge. Everything is just on the edge. Why don't we look towards that instead? Is it haram or is it halal? Oh, gelatine, I hear it's this or that. You can live your life without gelatine. It's not going to destroy your life if you can't eat Alan's snakes, for example, or whatever it is that you want. And it's Shah Ramadan and you really feel like it. That's, you know, would you give that up? Would you give up a sugar jelly lo a lolly? For min Allah, the one that has given you everything. Do you know, sometimes, if you do a small favor for a person, and they turn back on that favor, you do something good for them and they turn away, you hate them. I hate this person. When he needed $100, I gave him $100. When he needed a lift to work, I used to pick him up, but now he's got a car, he doesn't pick me up, for example. And you hate them for that little thing. What about the one that raised you and made sure you breathed and lived through every single night? Made sure that you were pain free. Made sure that you had loving people around you even when the world should have hated you. Allowed you to walk on the surface of his earth even when the earth should have swallowed you. Honestly, if you look at your deeds. Maybe we spent a little bit too much on this point, but this is very important. Why? It sets the framework. It sets the framework, inshallah, for the, for, the, for the ongoing discussion regarding this thing. And this is how you really have to turn around and look at things. Is this going to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not going to please Allah? The one who has rid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that feels the same from that love in hardship or in ease, in delight or in difficulty, in poverty or in wealth, in sickness or in health. Sounds like Christian marriage vows. This is the basis of it, that there's going to be that much love, that these things don't matter. I love Allah so much, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if I'm poor, I still love him. And if I'm rich, I still love him. They say this about the hadith about Amir al-Mu'mineen, when Rasulullah says to, about Amir al-Mu'mineen that, uh, Ya Ali, by Allah, the only one that loves you is a believer, a mu'min. And the only one that hates you is a munafiq. This is it. And the believer, even if you threaten him to cut him up, he will not hate you. He can't hate you. Even if he gets cut up, he can't hate you. And the munafiq, even if you offer him all the wealth in the world, he won't love you. He can't love you. It's not within him. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's the representative of Allah, but with Allah, it's the same thing. That your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shouldn't be applicable only when for example I'm healthy and everything is good and when it's bad I turn around the one who possesses the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of these difficulties and all of these things they don't matter to him in fact have you ever entertained this question some people ask one another and in fact it's funny because you always see it on the uh, you know those beauty contests the Miss Universe or the Miss World or whatever it is not that I'm a watcher of these contests, but obviously you have knowledge about them. And they bring them up, and all it really is is a bunch of old men ogling out young women in bikinis and different dresses. That's all it really is. But they look at it and make it out like it's a prestigious event. And to sort of validate the event, they say, you know what, let's ask this pretty woman, what would you do to change the world? What would you do to make the world a better place? And so they give them the microphone and they'll say something like, I'm going to cure world hunger. I didn't know she could produce that much milk. I'm going to stop war and bring about world peace. All right? Your dress isn't that pretty. The point of the matter is, they ask them these questions to sort of validate the whole thing. Of the ulama, it's narrated that he was asked this question, that what would you do if you had the power, Ismallah al-A'zam, to change something in the world? What would you change? So you begin to think, Bismillah al-Azam, I would wipe X country off the map. Bismillah al-Azam, I would wipe this race off the map. Bismillah al-Azam. And so he says, I would do nothing at all. He says, why? He says, do you think that if I have Bismillah al-Azam, my wisdom supersedes the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the knowledge of Allah? And does not Allah know that these things are happening? Does not Allah see these things happen and they happen under his reign and realm? His wisdom supersedes that. This is Rida Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have Rida Allah is to have this. We have many examples and I can't go on because we've run out of time. But inshallah we'll continue 
with this discussion regarding with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but we take a look at the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam these ones that we love and these ones that we read about and these ones that we tattoo our bodies with that we look at what it is that they did what did they do Imam al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi ridan bi ridaq is that not correct that when Imam al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi and it's interesting for people that aren't parents. People that are parents, you know what your children are. The Holy Prophet says your, ch your child is like an organ within your body is walking on the floor. Your liver or your heart is walking on the floor in front of you. This is what it feels like for a parent. Anything happens to that child, this is how you feel. I had a small incident once. Uh, my son was about two months old. Some medical incident or something and they wanted to give him an injection in the spine to get some spinal fluid out It was very small tiny baby and The second the doctor mentioned it tears began to fall down I couldn't hold myself just just by saying that he's going to take some spinal fluid from my child that was enough to to break me standing there and Abu Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi in that moment When he has his child and he's holding up his child and then what does he do? after the martyrdom of that child but fills his hand with the blood of that child and casts it into the heavens and says in kana if this is what pleases you O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the blood of the heart of my heart then take until you are pleased we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam Sharif. we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on our dead and to cure our sick we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the benefit of this month and the divine providence to attend Majalis al dhikr the places of his remembrance and for us to have the ability to complete the Holy Quran and do dua and benefit from this month something that will culminate all of our efforts to allow us to attain the rida and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen rahim Allah man kara surat al-mubarak til-fatiha wa ahda thawabaha ila arwah al-mu'mineen wal-mu'minat تصبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد